All right, everyone, I am here with Don Odike. Don is a data science manager at RTL, which is a subsidiary of publishing giant Bertelsmann. Don, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm super excited to dig into this conversation and learn a little bit about what you've been up to, uh, particularly on the ML ops front. Uh, to get us started, why don't we have you share a little bit about your background and uh, you know your data science journey? Sure. Um, so I have a, a background in artificial intelligence. Uh, studied that at the University of Amsterdam. Um, actually, started about 19 years ago. Um, um, after my uh, studies, I did a PhD in information retrieval, so search engine technologies. Um, did a lot of uh, diverse work in, in my PhD. So I did uh, an internship at Microsoft Research where I looked at what users of Bing are doing on a very large scale if they cannot find something. So if we saw them struggling to find something, what could we learn from this for future searches and how can we help them out in, in improving the, uh, help Bing out in improving that search. Um, some other stuff I did was more on the large-scale search around media. Uh, so uh, I did work with historians in helping them search in a um, large-scale video ar uh, news archive, um, newspaper articles. So it was about four centuries of uh, newspaper articles uh, that we provide exploratory search interfaces for. And I did some stuff with uh, broadcasters in um, searching for background information during like live talk shows, so finding links to people in the program, and that sort of thing. So it was a, a rather diverse slate of sort of research topics, uh, but all of it related to, to media or web search in some way, um, and always with an application in mind. So um, after my PhD, it made a lot of sense for me to go into industry, and I started uh, in a role as a first data scientist, but quickly also leading the team uh, at a Dutch startup called Blendl. Um, so Blendl is a, a news aggregator, um, which is back by the New York Times and by Axel Springer. And uh, the the idea of Blender was that you could um, buy newspaper articles and pay only for what you read. That was the original idea. So you pay in 30 cents for a New York Times article, for example. Um, so that their main product was a newsletter that uh, was sent every day through an editorial team of the best articles of that day um, selected early in the morning um, to read. Uh, and together with my team, we made it actually uh, into a fully personalized newsletter. And um, actually, the product plan became sort of your personalized selection of um, uh, newspaper articles uh, that you could get every day. Um, so uh, had a lot of fun building that. Um, but we also saw that what we actually had built was kind of what that startup needed at that point. So I started looking for other opportunities. And then joined uh, RTL um, about uh, two and a half years ago, um, helping them with, uh, with with data science and AI. Um, so uh, RTL is the biggest commercial commercial broadcaster in the Netherlands. Uh, so we have the attention of every Dutch citizen, sort of forty five minutes every day. So a lot of that is still on on, on television, uh, broadcast TV. Um, but we've been active online for quite some time as well. So we have a, a video on demand platform called Videoland, uh, which is competing on a local scale with, with Netflix. Um, we uh, have our news websites and our TV brands are active online as well. Uh, one of the more important products at uh, uh, RTL is a, a weather app, um, which in the Netherlands, where we often have rain, is uh, not an uh, uh, unuseful uh, product. Um, so th these are the kind of things that we actually work on. Nice. Uh, uh, your background in search is, is interesting. It always amazes me when I think of, you know, how difficult that problem is and, and, you know, companies, uh, you know, I always think of like the Home Depot website, Home Depot mm -hmm. being a big, uh, you know, hardware, home goods retailer here in the States. Uh, I don't know. Are they in the Netherlands? No, they're not enough, but uh, I'm familiar with them. Yeah. Um, but just trying to find things on their website is so bad. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It's, yeah. it's not because they're not spending a ton of money on search. It's because it is a hard problem. And then I went, you know, a lot of folks that I talk to in ML and AI, you know, cut their teeth on search. And in, in fact, you know, a lot in Bing and some of these large search engines. 
Yeah, you know, it's, it's a really interesting problem. Um, you, of course, have a, a lot of the challenges of, of trying to find a quick answer and um, you don't have a lot of time to think about uh, uh, what you're working on. So there's a lot of engineering challenges around that. But also on the AI side, it's, it's super challenging. Um, and I think it's also, I guess it's a problem we created ourselves a little bit as well with uh, the search box where everybody's sort of accustomed to typing in 2.3 words uh, and uh, then getting an answer very quickly in the first position. So that, that makes the expectation for all the other products uh, to have a similar kind of experience make that really hard to live up to. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Mm. Well, uh, walk us through some of the machine learning and AI use cases at uh, at RTL. Sure. Um, yeah, so r roughly, I see that we work in, in, in three areas. So I guess the more traditional data science and AI applications, I, I would call that sort of optimization of uh, uh, some of our problem, uh, some of our um, uh, challenges. So. Uh, we do, for example, um, forecasting for TV audience uh, ratings, how many people are going to watch and what is the demographics of this group so that we can select our advertisement in a, in a smarter way. So that's both on the forecasting side, but also on the allocation side. So we do mathematical optimization there for uh, um, for the um, what, what, what ads we show on, on broadcast television. Um, I think a big part of what we do is around personalization. I mentioned this already for, for Blendo, but it's definitely also the case for, for uh, RTL where we work on this. Uh, so for uh, Videoland, we are not nearly as uh, advanced in, in how much personalization we do as Netflix does, uh, but we do have similar kind of products where we personalize selections, where we try to get people to... to um, find more interesting uh, content in our big uh, uh, collection. Um, and similar kind of things we do for our news websites uh, where we recommend news articles and these sort of things. Uh, so that's the second major areas of personalization. And a third one um, that we um, uh, started working on in sort of the past two years, I guess, is more around understanding our, our, our content and um, uh, getting insights out of that. So. Uh, these are um, video AI applications where, for example, we work on automatically generating trailers for, for movies and series, um, automatically selecting stills for to show on our platforms, uh, selecting where to place a mid-roll in a, a video stream, and th these kind of applications. Uh, so these are roughly the three areas where we're working. Mm. And dig a little bit into that last area a bit. I've heard Netflix talk a little bit about how... Um, you know, when you are scrolling the video offerings page, those, you know, the, a given still that you may see or cover is very personalized for you and someone else who's looking at the same movie. It's not anymore that they're getting, you know, a, a handful of stills from Hollywood, but they're generating these dynamically from the film even sometimes. Is that yep. the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So um, um, Netflix indeed does this, and even sort of when you go to a detail page and see um, descriptions of um, um, uh, of the movie and why you may want to watch it, they even personalize that. That you oh. might be more prudent to uh, take a recommendation if it won an award, uh, and uh, that might be different for you than for me, for example. Uh, so these are really the uh, ironing out sort of the, the, the smallest bits of uh, optimization there, I guess. Uh, we're, we're, we're a stage uh, before that, I think, where right now we're, we're uh, um, initially automating this process so that uh, we are not spending time from humans doing this, uh, selecting these tails, uh, but also so that we can scale it up and, and, and personalize it. Uh, so we do this in uh, pages where we try to win back our customers, for example, where we know already kind of what the user profile that they have, and then we show them slightly different uh, artwork and images there. Uh, but we don't do this fully on our platform yet. yet. That, that's still in the end of our um, design us together with our algorithms to do uh, this still selection. But it's exactly the use case that we're working on, yeah. Got it. Uh, and so you know, talk about, um, talk a little bit about kind of the challenges that you run into with that application. I'm just imagining, uh, you know, at the very, at the very base level, video files are huge, movie files are, are large. Um, I'm imagining the ones that you're working with are even larger than the ones that uh, 
yeah. that you know we might see as as consumers. What what are some of the yeah? So so so, so what we the the, uh, the the basic research that we work with are these studio quality uh, uh, video files, but we quickly transcode them to to uh, smaller versions and, and feed that into our AI models. Also because we don't need that high quality for for these models. Um, but there is definitely a, a, a big computational challenge there. So working with video files is super heavy. Uh, we have 25 frames every second, and a lot of the image processing things that we work with are actually processing each frame uh, subsequently. Um, so that, that means that there's a lot of um, heavy lifting to do around uh, analyzing these files and also uh, figuring out uh, from frame level, for example, going to shot level and, and figuring out how to aggregate things like, uh, for example, faces that have been detected that could change during a shot. Uh, and somehow you have to get one number to figure out if that's a good shot or not uh, for a trailer. Um, so these are the kind of challenges there in terms of the modeling. Uh, but there's definitely an engineering challenge there. And um, I think that moving a bit to, to sort of the ML platform kind of questions around that, uh, that's also where, where we had um, some challenges to cover um, for making this scale and making sure that we can run this in, in production. Uh, so just to, to make sure we understand a, a concrete use case, you've got this video file started as a studio size video file, but you transcode that, make it smaller. And then, you know, this is say a two hour movie. Mm -hmm. You want to put that through a process where uh, at the end you've identified some number of ranges that make for good trailers. Is that an example of one of the use cases? Yeah, exactly. So, so we we boil this this movie down to 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 their scenes basically, and then um, from that we um, we pre-select what scenes could be interesting for for a trailer and for um, um, and, and that would be for an editor to to make a trailer out of uh, for broadcast TV, for example, where we uh, still do this. Uh, quite heavily, but we also make smaller trailers uh, ourselves. So these are often single scene, for example, just to highlight quickly what, what's in there and uh, what kind of scene is in there. Uh, so the, the AI task there, I guess, is to um, um, to rate a scene for how useful it is for in a trailer and uh, for how, how informative it is or how um, uh, how attractive it is to, to use in the trailer. Mm -hmm. And is that a, a supervised learning problem? Do you have uh, some database of trailers that performed well versus you know scenes that the, the ones that didn't <laughs> nah. uh, no, that direct, it, it's it, it, it's uh, not fully supervised in that we don't have, have negative feedback I guess uh, so we have our uh, editors creating these trailers for a very long time already for a lot of our content uh, so we can see those as, as sort of positive signals um, but um, Creating these traders is a very creative process, so um, um, they may have not selected the scene that, that we would find interesting, not because it wasn't there, but uh, wasn't attractive, but because they had another idea of how to tell this story. Um, so getting negative feedback is uh, slightly, uh, 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 yeah, it's something that we have to think about a little bit. So we can do some negative sampling, but it's not fully correct. So we were getting some feedback from from that from these editors and actually showing them trailers that we made and having them pick from scenes that we selected and uh, getting that feedback loop uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the? Can you talk a little bit about the the models that you're using in the pipeline? You mentioned face detection, so. Um, you know, I can imagine that, uh, you know, scenes with faces, you know, maybe more interesting, at least for a certain type of movie than, you know, scenes without faces. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the other things your models are, are looking for? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, maybe good to, to explain one thing before diving into this um, is that um, how, how we set this up is that we actually um, use uh, off-the-shelf but state-of-the-art models as sort of building blocks here. So, for example, face detection, we're not training our own face detection algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have the label data for that, and we don't want to generate that label data. So we take one off-the-shelf and reuse it in uh, a later stage. Um, so we have models for this that, that do a lot of uh, these sort of things, so face detection, but then also we're getting some facial features from this, like the position of the face, the size of the face, that kind of thing. Uh, we have 
uh, of the shell models for facial emotion recognition, for example, as well, that we're using there. Um, we have a, a model for image aesthetics and technical quality of a picture. So is your background blurry or uh, fully in focus? And these kind of things uh, are assessed in a model like that. Um, we do some some audio analysis uh, as well for, for, for this. So uh, figuring out mood and analyzing the music. Uh, so we have about 20 or so, I think, of these, these sort of basic building blocks that we are using uh, for, for this analysis. And then on top of this, we're learning uh, our own intelligence. So we take the output of these models and sometimes also uh, some of the uh, raw features from it, so embeddings and, and these kind of things, um, and use that then to build our own models for the high-level task, or for example, figuring out if uh, a shot is a, a good shot for a trailer or whether a still is a, the, the, the right still for uh, uh, getting attention to a movie. Um, and indeed, so um, phases are, are very important there. So we, we know that on most of our stills, uh, people prefer to see phases and see them sort of up front as well. Uh, showing some emotion often works really well for, for stills. Um, in trailers, uh, I think the, so. They, they, we, we look at also things like camera movement. So it doesn't it shouldn't be too quick because then you get sort of disoriented, I guess. Uh, uh, so these kind of things are what we try to take into account there, and what we're trying to learn in these models. Awesome, awesome. And so uh, these models and this problem that you're trying to solve ultimately, you know, you ran into some challenges that uh, you know were more on the engineering side. Once you had the the data science elements figured out, then you ran into these engineering issues. Can you talk a little bit about the issues that you ran into there? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think so the, the modeling side of things, uh, the, uh, it's super interesting. We do this a lot in, in collaboration with, with, with these creative people, with these editors. We show them stuff that, that, that we make. We sort of uh, sit next to them, see how they do their job, and that sort of thing. So that, that's what we're good at as uh, as AI experts and as a data scientists uh, to uh, to get that stuff out. Uh, but the engineering part was uh, definitely a big challenge uh, here. And um, I think one of these things is um, um, the so uh, zooming out a little bit the. the uh, systems that these editors work with, their production systems, they, they should never break. And then we come in as uh, sort of hackers trying to uh, uh, get our hands on all these video files. And uh, there's definitely some some culture or bridge that we need to uh, to build there to, to get them to to get some trust in that we can actually do some cool things with this data and that we can work with their production, production systems as well so that we get a, a, a automatic update when uh, new videos are appearing in the system uh, that we can actually put some stuff back into these production systems as well. Um, I think that that, that that has been a big challenge and not one really on the technical side, but definitely something that we ran into. Uh, so more on the technical side, uh, indeed, the, the, these models are, are, are very diverse and some of them require a, a GPU, some of them require tons of memory, some of them um, can be actually run in parallel, so we, we can run... Uh, um, multiple models at the same time on different frames. Uh, some of them have to be aggregated after that. So I think that that was a really big orchestrational challenge sort of on how to do this and how, what, what best infrastructure to use for that. Um, so um, um, I think that, that that's where, uh, in terms of machine learning platform, our biggest challenge lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in terms of orchestration, was it... Do you think of the the biggest challenges as collaboration challenges between data scientists on your team and, and um, among uh, one another and working together, or is it orchestration primarily from uh, you have these workloads, you have all this compute? How do you get the workloads yeah. on the compute and move it around? Or, or are they yeah. the same thing? No, the, the, the latter. It's the latter for sure. Um, so I know I mean, ML platforms can be really helpful if you have uh, big communities of data scientists trying to work together, working with the same sort of data, but these are not our, our, our challenges per se. So that, that part I think we can cover with, with our team and uh, through uh, interacting with the editors and other data scientists. Uh, the major challenges for us are making sure that all these uh, workflows are, are working and that, that um, we... Um, um, use the right hardware for, uh, or um, yeah, uh, hardware for, for for running the right challenges, uh, r running the right models, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
And so what were your initial steps in uh, trying to solve this, this problem? Well, yeah, so um, I guess, interestingly, uh, with this project, so, so I, um, this originates from, from sort of a hackathon that we did together with PhD students. Uh, uh, um, in, a, in about a week, we tried to automatically generate um, metadata for our news footage. So we have uh, archivists typing all these things out at the moment, and we thought we can probably do better. Let's see what we can do together with uh, uh, some computer vision researchers. Um, and what I hadn't expected to start going into that, that hackathon is that actually a lot of these um, models that we were looking at and a lot of the cloud service that we were looking at, that we were able to run these ourselves as well. Um, so um, uh, within a week, we had a cool working prototype um, that we could build on uh, from that. So um, I think from running initially that hackathon, we could see that, okay, we, we can do this ourselves, but we need some really good infrastructure for that. Uh, so for us, the project actually sort of started with thinking also about how can we actually do this at scale, because we knew that it, the, the seed was there, that, that it was possible, uh, but we needed to think about how to scale this. So we started thinking of, of a good architecture to do this, and um, what we um, ended up uh, building uh, for this was uh, it actually uh, we run that in in, in, in Pachyderm, um, and there uh, this whole workflow is orchestrated for us, uh, running on Kubernetes and um, using um, uh, these models um, um, in a workflow sort of uh, managed by Pachyderm. Okay, but tell us a little bit about the the user experience. What is it a data scientist need to do or need to think about to um, to deploy a workflow into this environment and have uh, have it kind of deployed out to the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, in, in this workflow, um, each processing step is uh, containerized um, where uh, Pachyderm takes care of connecting all the, the data to uh, the input data and the output data. Uh, so making sure that we have good lineage of that data throughout the full system. Uh, so that means that the data scientist, when he's building a new model or integrating a new existing model, what he's thinking about is sort of where's my data coming from, uh, or where's the video file or the images or, or that sort of thing. Uh, that part is taken care of by, by Pachyderm. So it's really like I have this one image or one video file, and now I want to run this model and output um, data into uh, uh, our, our own sort of consistent data format uh, where uh, so that we can aggregate this uh, easily. Um, so the, that means that these processing steps are relatively simple in the sense that they, they take one image or multiple images and output um, and the, the, the output of the model. Um, so uh, our data scientists um, build these models. Um, um, uh, so we have, we have all the code in, in GitHub and with CI/CD we're building these Docker images and those integrate into our Pachyderm system. So um, the, the workflow is, is sort of to locally build the first version of it and then with CI/CD deploy that into the uh, into the production system mm. or development system yeah and, and so the the git and you know containerization and CI/CD elements of the workflow were were those uh were those challenging for your data scientists to uh pick up or was that you, you have some data scientists that are kind of lean more to yeah. Yeah. side and you know those tools or the developer side those tools are natural and then others you know those those are foreign tools like where did your where was your team on the spectrum or did it vary uh it definitely varies and uh, still varies within the team um but uh the the, the the scientists working on this um they um they learned these skills rather quickly um they were also um in hiring sort of we, we looked for for this profile for somebody that can also do a bit of the engineering part and and pick that up uh, so that they can pick up the dockerization and the uh the ci cd part uh, we have a platform team also supporting us with the Kubernetes clusters and these sort of things and helping set up the CI CD workflow. So, so that definitely helped as well. Uh, but I do agree, this is something, a skill that, that, that you have to learn. And I think it's a very important skill for a data scientist to, to, uh, uh, to learn as well, to understand at least what's, what's behind it, how that model is, is used. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the Pachyderm product, I guess I think of it as 
take taking on two roles in what you're saying. One is um, managing the managing the underlying infrastructure or or kind of running your workflows on the underlying infrastructure, and the other is um, getting the data from one step of the workflow, you know, into your container to the next step into that container, et cetera. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So it's both making sure that we can scale these things, so we can um, specify how to how, how to scale sort of on, on this data, um, and also moving the data around. So we have, for example, we have one step that that extracts all the frames from a movie. Um, so that's a single step taking in a video file and then outputting a lot of uh, frames. Um, and then in the next step, through this orchestration with Pachyderm, we can actually uh, run multiple models on each of these frames, and Pachyderm takes care of the, the, um, that scaling and making sure that we don't use too many resources. Uh, that, uh, but, but we are doing this in parallel. So that, 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 that's, I think, one of the very strong things for, for this particular use case. Um, mm. So maybe going back to your initial description of the, the, the pipeline, you've got these building block models are those all created as independent uh, containers? And then you're using kind of the pachyderm as the wiring or interconnect to, you know, run all of those on a, a given frame and then take the output of that and some of the raw data to the next uh, yeah. level of abstraction? Yeah, exactly. That's it. Okay. Oh, very cool. And then how do you specify... Um, the the infrastructure requirements are you are your data scientists needing to write whatever the you know uh kubernetes uh specifications for scaling uh, or is there something a little bit so this is some of the things that we do together with with our uh, platform team so um uh, they help us set, set up the cluster in such a way that we have auto scaling on it and that we can use gpus and and have a separate research group for that in uh, in kubernetes uh, and then within the pipelines and in Pachyderm, these these specifications are, are, are rather simple, and it's still sort of in, in a YAML format, and you have to get sort of a hang of it. Yeah. Uh, but it's not as detailed as, as uh, really specifying your own pod specifications for Kubernetes, for example. Yeah. Okay. And before you went down the path with Pachyderm, did you look at just standing up a Kubernetes cluster and maybe using something like Kubeflow or? Uh, yeah, it, we definitely did, and, and Kubeflow is something that, that that we were interested in as well, uh, especially from for, for, from the data science and AI perspective. Um, I think it's it, it's a really cool product, something we would uh, enjoy working with. Uh, we we got some pushback from our platform engineers in terms of how many components that consisted of and how many of them uh, were relatively new to our infrastructure. So they felt a bit more comfortable with with Pachyderm as a sort of a one stop shop rather than getting that full uh, Kubeflow environment going for us. Um, I think so. Um, it also um, so part of going for Pachyderm was also for us. Um, it, a little bit of experimentation. Uh, so it was a product that we kind of liked, fitted our use case in some sort of way, but we also realized that, that we were probably these weird people that were using the Pachyderm system for huge video files that they were not typically used for. And uh, so it, it was trying out a little bit, but what I like about it is that the um, um, it, it forced it developing in sort of a way that, that it's super reusable. So we containerize everything. Uh, our, our Docker images are not Pachyderm specific. And we're even now running some of these same images in an Argo workflow, which fitted better with the um, uh, with, with the use case uh, rather than doing it in our own Pachyderm file system. So I think I, I like sort of the, the, the philosophy behind it and, and the way of working. And that's why we went for it. Um, but um, uh, we we may want to do this differently in the, in the future. I'm not sure about that. Nice. Um, so you know, starting at a hackathon and ending up with a you know full fledged platform supported by a platform engineering team. Um, that's a that's a bit of a journey. Mm -hmm. um, how did you how did you build the business case to? Or what was the business case to to get there? How did you build that? You know, what were your initial steps? Uh, how long did it take you to 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 scale up? I just have a yep. 
bunch of questions about the evolution. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so we 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 have an existing team, and I'm lucky enough to to have uh, sort of trust in and the importance of AI for our business moving forward. So, um, I mean, that, that that doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, RTL has invested in in data for a long time. We have uh, other teams, established teams that do things like uh, data delivery, reporting, and that sort of thing. So, all these kind of things. Uh, we as the data science and AI team, we don't have to worry about that. We uh, deal with the front part and we have some some leeway there and, and some um, uh, credit that we build up. Uh, so that meant that I could, could use some of our existing resources for, for this use case as well. Uh, but we also build up a business case for, for new resources. And um, initially this was very much focused on that uh, trailer uh, generation uh, project. Uh, so within RTL Netherlands, we have about 12 people um, doing this editing on a, on, on a daily basis. Wow. Um, yeah, so I mean, there, there there is a lot of this happening, and and we could easily make a business case where if we take a movie for from for two hours and drill it down to 20 minutes, um, that we could save a lot of time for these people, and they could work on more things, or we could have more, less people working on this. Um, uh, so that was relatively easy to build a business case on. Um, and um, we've we've extended that, that business case in. So we, um, we we've sort of sold this idea of, of these building blocks and getting different use cases on it, um, and try to see for all of these use cases whether we can make a business case out of it as well. So for the steel selection, we have a designer of Figulon doing sort of half his time selecting all these steels for all these programs, and he's he's getting pretty fed up with it as well. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's definitely some interest there, um, and, and so we we now have uh, basically a bunch of business cases that cover our efforts into doing this video AI and, and building up a platform for this. Um, and I think the interesting ne next sort of stage for us is that we see that this is not just the case for us RTL in the Netherlands, but also uh, looking at the uh, our, our parent company. Uh, so within RTL Group, which is sort of the direct parent company, we have RTL France and Germany. They're pretty big as well, but they're in 12 countries, I believe. Um, but for example, in Germany, there are about 120 people doing uh, uh, promo generation, so trailer, uh, creating trailers. Uh, so the business case is scale really nicely if we go to European level and go to Bertelsmann level, uh, sort of. Uh, so that's something that we're looking into now, how we can uh, do that. Um, and that whole system, including the pachyderm setup and all the uh, models that we've integrated, we actually internally open source that for us to use within Bertelsmann as well and organize hackathons around this internally and see if we can get others to, uh, to help us develop this and uh, develop it further. Hmm. And you're on a, a Bertelsmann-wide AI group or team. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Yeah, so within Bertman, I lead an AI expert group. Um, so um, maybe good to tell a little bit about Bertman before I dive into what we do. Uh, so uh, Bertman is one of the biggest media conglomerates uh, worldwide. Um, so um, I mentioned RTL already. So uh, there's a big television part of the of the company, uh, but it also includes, for example, Penguin Random House, the biggest book publisher in the world, uh, well known from the Penguin books. Um, there's a record company there, BMG. Uh, there's a whole services division, Arvato, uh, working um, on supporting uh, publishing and media uh, and other use cases as well. Uh, so it's it, it's a really big uh, 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 big corporation, and I think what's very interesting about it is a very um, uh, distributed organization. So um, um, all the collaborations that we have is sort of on a, on ad hoc basis and, and because we, we we build up a community around it. And one of these communities is our AI expert group. So this is well between 100 and 200 people sort of in, in all these divisions working on AI use cases or want, wanting to work on AI use cases. And with them, we organize things like hackathons. So I mentioned uh, uh, around video AI, for example, together with Pachyderm, Pachyderm we organized a hackathon. Uh, we, we did some... Um, uh, learn and hack event together with Google AI, for example. Um, so these kind of things is how we try to build up a community, work on specific use cases together, and more and more also get into the sort of the code sharing and code development mode where uh, we work in a central GitHub for some of these projects and others can join in the development process as well. Nice. Um, 
so as you as you develop the the business case for the the applications at RTL, you you know are looking at the you know the expected return in terms of the impact on the the workflow, of the folks that are you know trying to do this, the things that you're proposing to do with with AI. Some of these you've you know you've built out now. Like what is what's the other side of the business case? How has it played out in terms of the impact for the, the business? Um, well, so um, um, have we replaced a lot of people in their jobs? Definitely not. Uh, so what I think what we saw is that, the, um, um, uh, so we're, so two things around this. I think so. so get, getting into that, that production workflow—that's uh, something that that is super tricky to do, and and something where uh, um, doing this at scale uh, is is still sort of a, a challenge. We we've seen that the potential is there, but getting people to change the workflows—that's something that that that's a bit tricky to do. And I think what you also see is that. Um, the, once we free up more time, there's also more tasks to work on. So whereas before they were doing sort of uh, trailers for one week of a series, for example, we can now go back to doing that on a daily basis. So uh, I think that that's something they see happening. Um, I think that the speed up in terms of time uh, is definitely there. Um, but but uh, and uh, so we we haven't fired people based on, on what we've done basically. <laughs> uh, get at you know when you what what are the kind of success metrics of you know the the efforts around this particular project or or some of the others in your portfolio and you know as yeah. you make these investments and in models and platforms and all these things um you know how do you know if it's a worthwhile investment yeah, so uh, here the use case, uh, I mentioned that it was very much on, on time spent, so how much time it, it took to build these uh, trailers. Uh, and there we've seen an improvement um, uh, for sure. Uh, we also have more um, more around scalability sort of uh, KPI. So um, by being able to automate this process, we're able to personalize it more. Uh, so that means that we can get more engagement from 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 our users, like the use case we men- we, we discussed around uh, selecting thumbnails and, and uh, stills. Uh, so that's definitely something that we're looking into there. Um, and um, no, so I think that those are the main metrics that we focus on. So increasing engagement or increasing uh, reducing the, the the effort it takes to to do this. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that. Uh, we, we shifted our focus, I guess, slightly as well to uh, things that we were not able to do before um, and, and something that, that was not mainly really done before, but could still deliver uh, customer value. Uh, so, for example, we are now also detecting where credit starts so that we can show sort of a, a skip to the next episode uh, a button at a point or do a recommendation of new content there. Uh, this was a use case that was not possible before and that we're able to unlock because we have these models for it. Um, so I think that, that, that also is where we are seeing more, more interest and uh, more opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, maybe going back to the initial hackathon that, that set all this off. One of the things that I think I heard you describe was you had some use case that you wanted to attack in this hackathon and your initial attempt was to try off the shelf cloud services and then you eventually uh brought those in house and started building your own models uh, can you talk a little bit about the about that dynamic the the relationship between you know what you're able to do using off the shelf models versus building your own yep um yeah so i think so one challenge that we have is that that um, um our content is in, in most of our content is in, in dutch uh, which is not a, a language that uh, uh, is spoken by all of the world population um and that means that not always we have good models available for so for example for things, things like automatic speech recognition um doing it automatically for dutch is not an option whereas for english you might be able to, to do that even uh, in a live TV, for example. Um, so I think that this is one of the challenges that we saw that very often if we would take an off-the-shelf model, we would need to build something on top of it anyway because we needed to do it in, uh, uh, in, in not in English. 
Um, what we also saw is that that um, um, the um, our real interest was not in these sort of low-level model, models that the cloud providers uh, were working on as well, uh, but our interest was really in the use case after that, so how we use those models. And we needed a step anyway to learn a model, and by taking these off-the-shelf models uh, and then putting our own intelligence in that second level and our own labeling and where we have the data in that second level, um, that, that made a lot more sense for, for, for this learning problem as well. Um, and then um, I can imagine that we would still use some of these cloud provider uh, APIs, for example, for uh, a sort of building block for our own intelligence. But the, the, the real thing that we're optimizing, that we're learning, is one stage after that. And it's not uh, something that can easily fit into sort of a generic um, API like the Google Video Intelligence API or uh, AWS as uh, recognition or uh, the video indexer from Azure. All these things are for the generic purpose and we have a very specific task that we need to optimize. And for that, we need to learn our own models. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about the video use case as the driver for your kind of platform investments and maturity and all the things you're doing there. At the beginning, we talked about um, the other couple of use cases around optimization and personalization. Do you run those on the same platform? No, so actually, we we, we don't really. Um, so um, I think so for for optimization, a lot of it is um, uh, relatively small data uh, stuff you can run on a single cloud machine, and we don't need to go full fledged on this uh, on this platform. I think the data lineages could be helpful there, uh, perhaps. Uh, but we're taking this data from the data lake and using that sort of as a feature store here. So um, uh, I don't think we need to go fully for that for that platform there. Um, for uh, for personalization, uh, we have sort of the luxury that people spend a lot of time uh, watching content on our, our platforms. Um, so that means that um, when doing a recommendation, for example, um, we, we, we can take the time to uh, do that in batch mode and, 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 and get some fresh recommendation for the next day, for example. Uh, because once you start watching something, then sort of the, I guess our opportunity is sort of lost and, and we can take the time to slowly think about things. So we run uh, our personalization uh, for, for uh, what content to recommend. We run that just in, in batches nightly, for example. And um, it's something that, that fits with this uh, use case. Um, there we're uh, so we're working um, uh, with with Spark for for doing uh, this analysis uh, for our baseline model. So collaborative filtering is still something that we just run at large scale and is uh, difficult to beat. Uh, but we have some some models um, running in TensorFlow. So we have a sequence based recommendation model. We're experimenting with uh, uh, Bird for recommendations as well, and then seeing if these outperform our existing models in production. Uh, so that runs on our uh, on our cloud infra. Um, so we developed that in, in, in Databricks mostly, tracking it in MLflow. And for production, we uh, translate it to Airflow jobs that are uh, triggered on either Databricks or on Kubernetes. Hmm. Nice. Um, yeah, I'm curious what advice you would offer to folks that are interested in, you know, that are in, in similar positions to where you were, where you know, you've got some use case that you, you know, want to scale up, but, you know, dealing with the engineering side of things is, is a challenge or there, mm. uh, you know, are there things that you learn that you think would be helpful to other folks? Yeah, so I think I think we touched on, on two of them probably already. Um, so one is um, so I think as as an AI team at least you should be um, um, aware of all the engineering and architectural questions around what you're doing. So understand what how ML platforms can help you and how to get these things going in production. Uh, I think as, as an individual data scientist and AI expert, I think that that's well worth your time to understand how to dockerize things and how, how you can make those things a lot easier. I think a lot of our power as a team comes from that we're able to uh, jump into uh, teams and really deliver uh, almost end-to-end -end from uh, what we're trying to do. And for that, we need that, that engineering power inside the team as well. Um, so I think... Um, 
the, the advice is sort of individual advice more on the organizational level. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, um, for the, for this video AI project, we um, very early on started thinking about this platform and made the choice to go for for a machine learning platform relatively early on in this process. And I think that's something that uh, I, I would advise others as well to to at least explore that option and and, and, and uh, try some things out um, um, because it doesn't have to be uh, really heavy uh, in your infrastructure if you set it up properly, and then. Uh, especially in the case that you, um, that I think these steps are helping you in the process. Uh, so, uh, like dockerization or, or everything, it's something that useful to do anyway, um, and that fitted with what where we were going as a team as well. Um, I think it's a similar sort of thing is for delivering some of our services. We are working with serverless uh, ourselves as a team. Um, and while I can see that that sort of a lock in, in for example, AWS in our case, uh, I, I'm still okay with doing that because the, the thing that we're writing is really just the functional code and the stuff around it. We may switch it out and we may move it over and we may uh, develop our own APIs in Kubernetes next next year. Uh, but the thing that we developed is really just the business logic or the intelligence, and uh, it's not something that goes to waste. So I think that, that that's how I feel that it's good to think about these AI platforms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, since you mentioned it, what are you doing with serverless? Is that for inference? Yeah, yeah. So, so for for delivering our personalization models, but also search services, for example. Uh, with my background, of course, I, I needed to get my hands on on those services as well. Uh, so, translating whatever the user puts into the search box to to a, a query uh, running on uh, our Elasticsearch and personalizing that, that that that's the kind of stuff that we do at uh, at the inference level, I guess, or in production. And it's actually something that, that that's owned by the data science team. So they they work on this, these sort of things in production and and monitor that. that themselves as well, but uh, I think it's uh, slightly less common in uh, uh, in the industry in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Don, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through what you're up to. Very, very interesting stuff. Cool. Thanks.